It's really a privilege to be here indeed as uh, Art says, uh, many of you are as qualified as I am to speak on this issue of uh, sea level but uh, it just so happened I've been thinking about this subject for quite a long time as some of you may know and then over Christmas I happened to kind of uh, all the dots and everything fall into places that I thought I share with you some of these interesting uh, findings that I've been doing for the past few months. <coughs> yes, we'll talk about sea level change and then obviously as the title says, I'm going to tell you about the unfortunate situation in terms of uh, what we consider as science measurements and science experiment or science project. They're simply too big to fail. Also, I do have to make a disclaimer, as usual, I will get into trouble for even speaking and coming to a forum like this, but I've been here for 14 years, so this is really a very fun meeting for me. In fact, it's absolutely number one for me, my favorite. <coughs> so I'm very happy to meet all of you, some old ones, some new ones, and all that. The first disclaimer is that, well, this is not my house. <coughs> it's my cousin Oprah Winfrey house. <coughs> People thought that this is somewhat a joke, but then if you look at the next claim, this is a very old attack on me and of course our friend Sally Barunas and then of course the great uh, Frederick Seid, which is former president of National Academy of Science. And to link me with Seid, I mean I felt I'm totally unworthy because I couldn't shine his shoe. This man is really amazing solid state physicist, but regardless, these people consider me and Sally to be Sally Badunas, by the way, is my very close colleagues, and most of you know her. And she comes to DDP very often. In fact, she's the one that brought me to DDP. <coughs> Talking about us, you know, having this secret Swiss bank account. That's why I'm trying to tell you, I do not own the house, so please. <coughs> and of course, we are the people who take dirty money from the meanest villain on earth in a plot to allow mass murder by weather chaos, so by denying global warming especially the CO2 part of it. But then, of late, there are even more aggressive things, which I don't understand. I don't know why these people are so angry, by the way. I'm a really seriously very happy person. So I'd like to dedicate my talk to uh, Dr. Doug Craig, who called me a prostitute, that I pretend to be a climate scientist, that I'm a pure slime without value, a traitor to science, truth, humanity, the earth, children, and future generation, and life itself. Oh my God, <laughs> honestly, I think it need no defense, but then I dedicate my talk to him for being more peaceful and I guess less uh, obsessed with this money and all this verbal attack that is highly abusive. So the talk, <clears throat> it is the, has two parts. The first part will be evaluating all this big satellite project that I would say if you want to count money, it's really serious money. We're talking billions and billions of dollars. It's about how all this claim that you must have heard by now that the sea level is not only rising but of late, especially since 1993, I guess the last 20 years or so, it's been accelerating. Okay? Hint that it's all somewhat related to CO2 induced uh, global warming and then the melting of the ice sheets and so on and so forth. But I want to point out that in fact you can show rather convincingly in my own way and I hope you will judge whether I fail or I success on this, that these experiments are essentially failed experiments. They have no calibration, no believable or anything in, in my own way. I'll show you why I say that. In fact, words are very important. You don't simply accuse people of making false experiments and failed experiments by not showing you some proof and why. The second part, I'll talk about tight gauges, which is the most common way of uh, measuring sea level. <coughs> okay? And I'll give you a bit of perspective on what happened, especially on how you try to really be a little bit more prepared and so on and so forth. In fact, the tragedy is indeed. This obsession with CO2 has caused us to lose sight on many of the more serious problems about all this sedimentation and then the sinking of the major river delta all over the world from you know, New Orleans, Mississippi to you know, the Ganges, you know, in uh, Bangladesh and then in Chao Praya, for example, in Thailand and so on and so forth. These are the things that we don't work on and then we just keep concerning with this CO2 and then, by the way, only if you cut the CO2, then all this delta will start to rise, I guess, you know, rise again, not, not sinking. <coughs> so, just as an introduction, I'm quite sure some of you know, but then, why, I mean, sea level, by the way, what is sea level? It's really a very difficult subject, by the way. 
It's influenced by so many variables. The first easy one, for example, is that if you have an ocean, if your water warmer or cooler, if you warmer, the, the, temp the, the, the water tends to expand a little bit, right? If you cool, it shrink. Then there is also the factor of uh, ice sheets and glaciers and all that. If you melt that, if the water actually run off into the ocean, of course, you can have some sea level rise. But then I think the most important two factors that I often not really want to discuss is basically related to the geology, the, 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 the basin itself, you know, the earth structure, the, you know, the response of the system to putting weight on it, and you know, how it bounces back. And then basically what I'm talking about is land movement, the river deltas, you know, how we control our rivers actually, more generalization, so on and so forth. These are the historical problems and issues, right? Tectonic displacement, earthquake, for example. Then you also have, of course, this handling of water, like the dam in China, right? You basically can lower the sea level by 0.2 millimeter per, per year, for example. So that sort of thing. <coughs> so let me start with very surprising facts. The very first fact about sea level change is that if you look at the best reconstruction that we have, over 2,000 years, you can somewhat see this history. I'm not saying that this actual history is like this, but I'm just trying to tell you that at least it looked like it's going up, but then there were times in which, during Middle World Warm period, that the sea level was relatively higher than present today. That is really surprising in, in my view, because as if you keep hearing this news, you obviously think that sea level is accelerating and then, uh, you know, we're, we're in trouble now, actually. But then, a thousand years ago, obviously, there was no SUV. I think we need to understand, right? Is the sea level really that high then? What's the proof? Well, here's one way to look at it. I say you ask William. Of course. I don't know much about history, but then it so happened that I independently just sort of uh, studied these things, and then it turns out that he has a bit of an answer for us. I'm going to mention something later that basically related to the castle that is in Pevency. That's the place where William lands, coming from France, the Frenchies, and then Battle of Hastings. And these are other locations which I'm not familiar with, by the way. Like I say, I'm not historian, but some of the quote that I'll put were related to these two areas. These are the areas where it used to be, according to this study that's very recent, this person from Australia happened to just visit there February of 2013. She said that, you see, in, in 1066, the road that they, they were traveling was actually along the sea coast, would have been completely underwater. You see, and then there were even gates in the castle that we're referring to, of course, the Pevency Castle where the sea gates were actually people push prisoner into the thing so that they were actually go away by push away by the tides and so on and so forth. And then the town of the battle, the battle of Hastings, it's not on the sea coast anymore. You can see the number for yourself. It's eight kilometers or eight miles inland now. And then the castle is 1.5 kilometers from the sea. Right? That's a thousand years ago. Again, she in insists that this is not a geological situation. Right, so where, where is this CO2 recent global warming acceleration issue? So I think that the curve that we just show is realistic in that sense. Of course, I'm sure that if you keep studying the issue, you will be able to come up with more uh, exact uh, situation like this. Here's where the castle is today. Do we guys see any water rushing in into this castle? I mean, obviously, this is really an inland uh, property. <coughs> but then, you know, for IPCC, this is not good enough, right? I mean, something that is uh, fine and normal and all that is just not enough for them. You have to really look forward another 100 years. So the usual situation in IPCC is this, and I'm just basically showing you a chart from the upcoming report that will come out in uh, two, uh, September or so from the IPCC. It's the AR5, it's the fifth assessment report. By the way, please, I'm sure that many of us, many of the speakers later will speak of the Heartland effort to produce a counter NIPCC report number two is coming out also. So I, I, I hope that uh, some of you will read that report and then basically contrast that with the IPCC report. <coughs> As you can see, the sea level, like I say, is going to accelerate, it's going to go much, much higher. Okay? Very, very high to the point where I think it will be of concern if those scenarios are true. But then, as you already can tell, my purpose of this thing is to try to point you that most of these projections are completely bad signs. I would say rotten signs, if I may use so. It's really, really bad. <coughs> In fact, I remember the other day I got into trouble with my uh, division 
where someone, I, I say something like, you know, the IPCC science is sick. Those people are sick. You know, they're not studying science. And I got called into that because I was saying sick science. <laughs> I don't know, it's really sick. This science is not healthy. They're they are really doing something bad because I don't understand what they're doing. Of course, you have already heard Jane talking about the great uh, Reverend Jim Hansen, the former director. And uh, again, we couldn't make this up, right? I mean, the IPCC scenario of rising of 100 years of about one meter or three feet is nothing compared to the 16 feet that uh, Jim Hansen is offering to you, okay? We couldn't make this kind of graph up. These people have a lot of free time that they take, take a map and then just kind of uh, doing some kind of animation as if it's so impressive. It's very scary. But then we also have another one. Same number offered by, of course, the Reverend El Gore. Which now, if you see my title, is, 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 these are really signs of politics. I mean, it's Hansen informing Go or Go influencing Hansen. I don't know which is which. Because, you know, they're kind of very consistent in terms of their message. It's not about the IPCC scenario because those IPCC scientists are not good enough. For Reverend Hansen and Reverend Go, it is the 16 feet rise that is going to be coming in another 100 years, very, very quick. I don't know how they're ever going to melt those ice sheets, by the way, by shining CO2 laser on those ice sheets. I mean, that will be scary. Not only that, those people are so out of their mind, in my view, my humble view, by the way, I speak freely as myself again. Look at the scenario they are proposing. They are now fighting. Jim Hansen, for example, published this chart in his paper, arguing that the other guy that talked about this linear rise of the sea level by 5 meters, which is, you know, as you multiply by 3.3 .3 or so, so it's 15, 16 feet, that that model is wrong and then his model is more correct. So he's arguing that the other scientist, Richard Alley, by the way, who say those things from Penn State University, says that, oh, this rise, you know, has to be like this, and then he says it has to be like this. These people are playing with this kind of a crazy curve and they call this science. Do you think that, can I, can I say this thing sick science? I mean, really sick in my view. I don't care what other people say, you can put me in jail if you want. But then, you know, IPCC, what is this, man? The United Nations have a better idea. They say, well, this is a prediction actually they offer in October of 2005. Our friend Anthony Watts, of course, has also blocked on this issue, but then I studied this thing independently. They say that by 2010, there will be 50 million refugees. What year is this now, guys? 2013, right? I don't know. We keep asking, where is the 50 million refugees? I mean, this is published there and they're talking about, of course, the main issue, again, is related to the sea level rising so rapidly that it's going to engulf everything, right? You know? Oh, US Southwest, of course, Southeast and then Mexico and all these places, right? So these are the situations that offer that you will have 50 million climate refugees, 2010. Where is the climate refugee, guys? You guys heard of that? Any of that? I guess we couldn't find them, right? <clears throat> but then you know that once 2010 passed, 2011, you know that UN now is saying that, well, 50 million, same numbers, but by 2020. This is the new game. <laughs> If the prediction doesn't come through, just extend the timeline a little bit. By the way, our friend Anthony Watt, who will be the speaker next, did a very good thing. I, of course, is one of those lazy persons. I mean, he, Anthony, for example, saw this thing, this, this quote, by this professor from Los Angeles, UCLA. And then Anthony actually wrote to that professor and asked her to defend herself. Where is your data? How do you, how do you defend this? By the way, that projection comes from a crazy Oxford guy, ecologist by the name of Norm uh, Myers, which is one of those Paul Ehrlich friends. <coughs> so I guess it's very scary, isn't it, right? The world is just going to stop scaring ourselves to death. I mean, please. That's not enough. That's really not enough because these people are very aggressive. This guy eventually retracted this statement, of course. But think about what they're trying to do. These people are so emotional. I mean, they are really very unhappy in my view. I don't know why. I mean, they say that, you see, they compare all of us. Oh, by the way, sorry, not all of you, me, me. <coughs> Global warming deniers, you know, we are very different from this, uh, this guy who in Oslo who killed so many kids who shoot people, you know, this bearing Breivik. He said, we're talking about hundreds of millions, okay, that these people are disagreeing with this. Art Robinson, I'm sure you're one of this guy, <laughs> so you belong to that. So you really call for a lot of us to be 
I guess, executed, right? Because, simply because we couldn't find this scary scenario from the scientific data that, they, that all of us could measure and come up with. All right, we're going to get to the business now. <clears throat> so these things, it's about this four scale of global sea level acceleration using modern satellite. Here's the information. <clears throat> it's essentially from since early 19th century or so until now that you have data of the sea level curve that look like this. That you have a slow rise and then boom, rise again and then boom, rise again even faster rate. Ever increasing. Obviously, would we contest any of this if this data to be correct and true? No, 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 not ever if it's really true. Okay? I would never do that. Never, because there's no point. Obviously, this data is rotten, actually, really bad data, okay? And I'll explain to you why. And especially the last part which I want to start with, which is that three millimeter per year sort of uh, uh, data. Those are basically from satellite measurements. They are from basically satellite going around the Earth at high al uh, altitude, you know, pointing radar down. Okay, but anyway, so let me, let me explain that in a minute. But as this cartoon would say, right? It will be accelerating so fast that, you know, we don't have to do anything. <laughs> but then, if you really want to look for fast sea level rate, I am quite sure that we have seen it all. The Earth geology, the Earth history has seen it all. This is actually a curve of the estimate of the sea level change for the last 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years or so, right? Where we have an ice age, uh, a really full ice sheets going around uh, North America and elsewhere, where you can see the rate. The fastest rate actually occurred at those times that is about 50 millimeter per year rate. Okay? And then even the recent rate is of the order of 2 millimeter per year for the last Holocene uh, 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 data sets. I wouldn't say that we are, we'll be too concerned of rate of even 3, by the way, but then the 3 data is really not a very good set of data, which I'll explain in a minute. Just to put in the context, to get 50 millimeter per year, do you know what does that mean? That means about almost three Greenland ice sheets melting, not only melting, melting so fast, within a few centuries you can get this melting. I mean, you simply don't have heat source like that to do this, okay? The, the situation during this uh, ice sheets uh, to transition to Holocene was completely different, okay? Now let's get to satellites. <clears throat> the assumption that I can clearly say is that, well, they think that the satellites can do this and can do that, can measure this global sea level change so accurately and precisely. As I say, this project is basically called satellite altimetry, to measure altitude, right? Altimetry measurements. It's satellite going around, trying to look down. It's actually a rad active radar system, of course. You shoot this radar down, and then you're trying to determine all this complication, right? In terms of the situation. And the satellite is about 1,300 kilometers, and then going around 65 degrees north and south. And we got data from 1993 until basically now. Okay? But then don't have exactly from one satellite, so it's really a combination of a few satellites. So that's basically one of the methodology that claim to be very, very accurate. But then let me point out now. Here is now some numbers to try to understand this system of measurements. They're supposed to be very, very impressive that detect this 3 millimeter per year change. But I ask yourself, do you confidently think that you can actually get the measurement to the accuracy of plus or minus 1 millimeter per year? By the way, the code, the formal error bar that they show is plus or minus 0.2 millimeter per year for sure. So five times smaller even. The first thing you should note is that, first of all, the radar frequency, the wave, is of the wavelength of uh, 6 centimeter to 2 centimeter. Okay? If you have a wavelength that is going down, that is actually on 2 to 6 centimeter, do you think that you can resolve anything to plus or minus 1 millimeter? I, I have a little problem understanding that one. And then for the individual pulse resolution, the, the resolution, the formal error is 1.2 meter. And for a thousand pulse, you pulse it very fast in nanoseconds, you can get it down to 4.7 according to them. I just don't believe any of this is achievable. Another point that I wanted to point out is, look at the footprint of this, this radar. You cannot resolve anything between 3 to 10 kilometers, okay? The most important thing is that when you, this radar is shooting, remember, you're trying to measure the sea level. 
So any data, for example, you must have seen this map that they're showing, sea level rate change, right? Most people never even white out the coastal region because the land and the sea, they just couldn't tell the difference. So there's really, really no information on the coastal region where we needed the most, where we have all the tight gauges, okay? There are a few tight gauges around oil rigs, around floating around in the ocean. Not only that, think about the reflection from all the ships, okay? Did they ever accounted for those things? It's not an easy problem, by the way, if you think about it, if you add more complexity. So I have a proposition to try to show you that why this accuracy is not achievable. It's simply not true. Now, let's go back to the basic. How does the raw data look like? As I told you, you have series of satellites. The first satellite that went up is the US and French project, Top X Poseidon, going that data. And then later we have more money, we put more money in Jason 1 and then Jason 2. In fact, Jason 1 almost ended, so they have Jason 3 coming, by the way. This is the absolute uh, raw data, if you look at it, right? And, and you're really trying to resolve a plus or minus uh, one millimeter per year rate from this kind of data, okay? Let's see what the author says. The author says, indeed, we have a bias of about 100 to 75 between these three satellite systems. So I, and, and remember, remember, for Jason 1 and Jason 2, they are almost exact instrument, okay? All right? And then by the way, they even have overlapping flight. Within these two satellites, when they overlap, trying to calibrate, they are flying within almost like 60 seconds of each other, okay? That is really amazing, and you couldn't even get the absolute level in a closer sense. So this is really a very serious uh, measurement problem. It's a difficult problem, difficult technical challenge and they really oversells the results. So here's the bias, as you can see, right? 75 between Jason 1 and Jason 2, 100 millimeter about that, between two packs. By the way, about is not good enough, really, if you want to detect uh, plus or minus 0.1 millimeter per year. Here's the first problem. <clears throat> Even the 75, okay, if you use, there are two curves there, they're based on two different uh, groups doing it. One is the French group, one is the NASA Goddard uh, Space Center flight in Maryland group, showing you that over the cycle, by the way, this satellite go about 10 days per cycle. So, you know, that's the, basically what the cycle means. So between Jason 1 and Jason 2, you can see that there is actually not only the mean that you subtract, the time changes. So the 75 or 76 or so, it's just very all over the time. So the, you can see the amplitude of this thing is not a small thing, it's four or five millimeter. That's one problem. And then that's what they're trying to tell you. Look, the final, doesn't matter what all this data is, the final output is that it's this curve that's going at about three millimeter per year. Because we know how to put them all together. We know how to adjust this thing up and down and then put them all together in a line and it's only increasing, it cannot be decreasing, okay? I say that if this result is valid, I really think that I should quit science because this is not valid results, okay? I have more to show you, of course. If you look further into the literature, only a few years ago, six years before that, that, that 2010 paper by Naram, first they say it was 100 millimeter in, in this new paper, but the previous one, if you look at the previous paper, they say the difference between Topex, Poseidon, and Jason is 154. You already know that you're not looking at the real thing, by the way, right? That's strange because they just say the new paper, is, the difference is uh, 100 millimeter. Now it's another 50 around. I don't know where that come from. Okay? I just don't trust this sort of work. Then look at this quote itself, in terms of whether we can account for all these different instrumental problems, all these errors. This quote is very important, because the author clearly know the problem. We f can find no correction that accurately account for the full 75 millimeter bias, for example, between Jason 1 and Jason 2. Okay? The two satellite altimeter. altimeter. Even though you, if you, you account for this ionosphere problem issues, and then you can only account up to five millimeter per year. Guys, five out of 75, that's not very impressive. We really don't know where the problem is, by the way. That's what they're talking, blah, blah, blah. We don't know anything, basically, right? Thank you very much, give me more money. <laughs> so I really, really, categorically don't think that this is a valid thing. We have, I have more to explain, of course. So you ask yourself, could it be that it's just simply this problem, that technical problem, so you should be more kind, really, you know, what's the problem, man, you know, these people are trying to do their best, you know, you're so mean and all that stuff. But science, excuse me, and nothing to do with mean or me or anything, it's about what you actually can measure. So 
I don't think so. You already know the answer. The title of my formal thing is about five or six experiments. By the way, it's about seven, if you guys can count later. <coughs> I think there are more issues. So in this chart, it so happened that I was able to keep track of uh, what is being produced in the French uh, website. If you look around February 8 or 2012, okay, what I want to point out is that it's the yellow curve, the NV set, the environmental satellites. You see the curve there? It's kind of not rising and then boom! A year later, it conformed to the, the curve together. You know, all these other, you know, that's what they always say. Yeah, let's get along, everybody just go on the line, right? I mean, this is a really strange way of doing science, by the way. It's embarrassing. So you can count, actually, there are two more satellites projects around, ERS-2 and GFO, okay? Those are all satellites that are actually doing different kind of measurement, that, but they happen to have active, active radar. So to do this, uh, uh, Altimeters, uh, altimetry uh, uh, measurements. Okay, so you already see some wrong. We also have to add in NVSET. What is NVSET? Well, another problem. Now, if you study NVSET and JSON2 minus uh, NVSET measurement minus JSON2, so that's the left axis, right? You see that these things, the differences, the biases, actually depends on the amount of uh, sunlight heating on this satellite itself. So the slight thermal changes would allow you to have this kind of problem, okay? This is a very hard measurement, by the way. And I forgot to tell you, this satellite floating at about 1,300 kilometers, the, with the help of GPS, you can get the altitude of this thing and the position of this thing up to plus or minus three centimeter. Three centimeter. You absolutely cannot resolve anything down to this level of 0.1 millimeter per year or point, no, no, whatever you want. That number is just too much to believe. Too much, okay? There are many more problems. You probably didn't know later I mentioned, but here's NVSET, right? It's about 2.3 billion euros. It flies about March of 22, 2002 to about 2012. The satellite finally ended. So you know the date, April of 2012. Let me see. Well, before that, the raw data of uh, NVSET, okay, compared to JSON, Okay, because they overlap in actual timing. So you have two, diff two different satellites but measure about the same time, right? From 2004 to uh, 2012. You can see that uh, before that they didn't really, because NVSET was measuring, was, was a project that doing something else, not focusing on sea level, so, but they have the data. They disagree. The rate of uh, rise is only 0.5 millimeter per year, which is, seems to me much more believable, in, in, I'll explain why in a minute, because there are other sets of the data that can try to explain this. But then the JSON 1 one is of course four times bigger, right? Then you look, after that, boom, they have to agree guys, no choice. That's the way data are being handled this day, all right? That they now agree, roughly two, okay? But please, we need to understand, right? So now if you look at the NVSET, the unadjusted versus the adjusted, you can obviously see that they, they pull this thing up, right? Please, somebody got to explain to me why you can pull this up. I don't care actually. If it's, if it's correct reasoning to explain to pull this up, I'm fine with it. But then please look into the literature. Please ask the chief scientists of all these people who get paid so much money. Tell them to explain to you how can they adjust this. Show me the formal steps. So you can immediately see April 6, the project end about April 12, April 6, I happen to be able to keep this curve that looked like it's 0.4 and then after April some 8 or something, I forget, it's the, it's the day where the satellite dies. April 10, boom, immediately goes up. Strange, very strange way of doing science. I don't know, I hope you get the point now, right? Is this measurement any good, guys? Good, thank you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> small little quote. If you ask yourself who is the world most, again, I'm not invoking authority being anything, but then this is a serious scientist. His name is Professor Carl Wundt from MIT. He clearly believes in CO2 can cause ice sheet to melt, by the way. But he's a very serious oceanographer. In 2007, with two colleagues, he published a very in-depth paper. Our friend Professor Dick Linson of MIT liked to quote this a lot, and I often also use this. He kind of essentially complained that it remained possible that the database, this satellite altimetry database, is insufficient to compute this, compute this mean sea level trend with the accuracy necessary to discuss the impact of global warming. As disappointing as this conclusion may be, right? Some of the sociology obviously involved. 
that you know we couldn't measure these things. Now, remember we saw that MVSET sort of doing something like a 0.5 or so, or one millimeter per year kind of rate change before, before they got corrected. I really think that those numbers are a lot more reasonable because all you need to do is that look at the, the pre-satellite before they correct all of this, before they kind of get much more active. So I've been tracking this topic for a long time, by the way. It's, it's basically, my breakthrough is basically realized that NAREM 2010, the first, you know, that new paper that basically discussed, show some of this chart that totally convinced me that these people are not doing the right measurement. But I was aware of all this kind of work for a long time. For example, you look at the early stage, NAREM 1997, right? They got rid of roughly like that, Topex was island, with no major correction. The French group, a separate independent group, got something like one, okay? And then, by the way, the high peak there is something related to the famous El Nino of 97, 98, okay? This is just basically, you know, the sea mass, the water mass floating, you know, sloshing around the ocean. And create a height that is slightly higher when, when El Nino event is very active. So that's another factor, right? And then if you look back even another paper, you can see the data. There's just no trend back then. And then all of a sudden, because the religion say that, the CO2 religion say that we have to have this sea level rise and rapidly accelerating. So we got to pull the data up. You can even look back the code. But the main point I want to put in this code is that it's not the, the flat sub because you've seen already three graphs. It's basically, I don't know how many of you are aware. Would you fund a project who's, who makes so much claim that they want to measure this sea, sea level change with high accuracy from space? But then in the end, guys, we don't have no calibration with ground truth. Now we calibrate with tight gauges, guys. How do you calibrate with tight gauges where your foot point is three to five kilometers away from the, the, the land? Okay, because you cannot resolve those things. The signal got confused. You know, the reflected uh, thing. It's basically calibrated with the tight gauges, selected tight gauges. Later I'll explain a little bit about how some of the oil rigs uh, uh, tight gauges data are used. They say, well, they found a drift because we compare to tight gauges, they're not the same. So we correct them, so that's how we get two. See, this is the formal explanation, guys. We're not measuring anything. We're measuring satellite, quote unquote, independent measurement is actually flat. But then we found that the sea level, then I don't know why do we need a satellite project, guys? I mean, if we want to believe in the tight gauges, then we shouldn't believe in the satellite, no? I'm confused. <clears throat> Here's one of the weird curve that they actually better produce. It's basically calibration of the topex with the tight gauges, selected tight gauges. And I like to point out that although they use some of the station that is actually in the middle of the ocean, those are all oil rigs and all that. The reflection from those things are also not, <laughs> not very good. I don't think it's a good calibration. That's why the, the calibration profile, this correction that they suggested to put into the, the Topex Poseidon altimetry data is look this weird shape. I mean, I don't think this function is anything that describable by the reality in that sense. So I'm not very confident in, in that correction methods. They work hard, they work hard, no doubt about it, but all work hard towards getting only the answer. You know, never about just inquisitive findings that, okay, we correct this in the proper way and then everything accounted for all. I told you the error budget, they can only account for five out of 75, for example, between JSON 1 and JSON 2. What kind of uh, confidence is that? I'm not so confident. So, but then, guys, we gotta be very concerned, no? Are you, are you still, I mean, most of you guys are too relaxed. I am very concerned because El Goa and Nansen already predict, predicted this. This is now related to another issue. What if? Excuse me, they always say, what if? You know, maybe it's not rising today. You just wait tomorrow, a day after, another 50 years, another 100 years. It's going to rise very fast, according to Hansen. You're not going to see this for 80 years, and then by 2080, boom, it's going to go five meter, four meters like that. Okay? Believe him. He's a, you know, exponential curve, man. You guys don't know about math. But then I tell you, in the academia world, it's a lot more radical than that. These people are not happy with 5 meters or 16 feet. This guy from, uh, he's a full professor, by the way, from UC of Delaware system. I mean, he's talking about 15 meters in, in Delaware. There's nothing left, by the way. So the green part is the land, and then, of course, blue one, please. I hope you know that's ocean water, according to them. So they want the whole ice sheet to melt, the Greenland plus the West Antarctic ice sheets. So you got 15 meter, you go multiply by 3.3, I don't know how many foot is that, but it's a lot, right? 
These people really, really can do a lot of creative things if you just give them a little bit of these color pens and all this stuff. <coughs> well, that's what happened. That's what happened, guys. You just be creative and have a little bit of image processing skill, something like that. So it's not my work, of course. It's by a very person who now, very hot. She, I mean, this person has been creating a picture like this for a long time now. This is, of course, you all know it's Washington, D.C. Now I give you another one, which is, of course, I'm kind of concerned because I have to, by the way, they move me out of that office around that area, so I'm in Siberia, so I'm glad in Siberia now. This is the main campus, all right? Guys, the United States oldest institution, gonna go underwater, guys. All you have to do is do animation, do color, completely. You know, you can see the angle from here is that you will see only the column when it's 25 feet. This is the oldest institution, gonna be fifth. The scenario was for 12 and 25 feet, okay? Unbelievable. I mean, well, maybe they're right. The ice sheet really could melt because we shouldn't judge them or joke around. We really need to measure how is the ice sheet doing, actually. Can we have any system of measurements that we can bring some insight into the, this topic? This is another part of the satellite measurement problem that I want to talk to you about. So now they have another one, Grace. This is really expensive. This is really a fine experiment, by the way. Two satellites floating around have a real calibration between their relative distance and all this stuff. They're really trying to measure the different gravity, you know, the potentials and all that stuff. Really fine measurements, in, interesting stuff. But then I would say it's another failed experiment, guys. I really don't understand this sort of work, but it's, it's interesting. They try, you know, I don't know how to judge any other thing. All I know is that the result doesn't seem to be too valid. Here's what happened. What did they do? Well, guys, here we go again. In terms of the GRACE data, their raw data, as you can see, is the bottom one. You know, in terms of actually the ocean mass, this is actually measure, measure the, the mass of the, in the ocean of water. Are we adding or, or subtracting uh, 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 water to the ocean? If all the ice sheet melted and melted rapidly and scary, then you should actually have a positive rate, right? And then I will tell you in a minute about they corrected for this. They say, well, that is not the right measurement. We have to correct for this thing called the glacial isotatic adjustment. In the world, there are only two, three people doing this kind of work. The famous one is Richard Pelter from University of Toronto. There's a group at GSFC, okay, some younger person. And then there's one, uh, Jerry Mitrovica, which is a former postdoc of, uh, of Peltier at Harvard now. They are the one that really are dominating the whole field because nobody knows what the land motion is about. So all they're doing now, even you use tie gate, you use satellite altimeter, you use uh, uh, grace measurement, you have to use this so-called GIA, Glacial Isotatic Adjustment Model, to try to show you the, the movement of the motion. The idea is that the ice sheets was pushing down on the Earth so much, now that the ice sheet goes away, so the, the, the Earth crust and all this system reflexively respond to it, right? Plus that, remember, this is only one factor in terms of land movement. It's far more complicated than that far more complicated. You've got tectonic activity, you've got sea floor spreading, all kinds of stuff. Remember, you are trying to measure something very small, millimeter per year. Okay? Here is now Peltier in a very, very uh, kind of a quiet paper. I don't think too many people read this paper in full. I have read it about 10 times before I dare to speak to you. There's a very interesting uh, exchange between Richard Peltier and a very, another famous professor from, uh, he's a blind mathematician from UCLA. Here's what the data say about GRACE on the air, water, and produced by two different groups. One is CSR, which is the Texas group, the Center for Space Research, and then this is the German Potsdam group. In terms of their uh, the raw data for, for GRACE, showing you that actually the ocean is not adding mass, it's actually losing mass, guys, okay? And the, the, the interesting exchange between Peltier and this Michael Gill guy is basically the argument now is that how do we correct for this? Peltier, Peltier come out with, with the idea, with the notion that that's why he has this model. He has this ice sheets model that you know how the, you know, you assign some kind of visc viscous response and all that stuff in the earth crust, how we move. So he has this model. He argued that because so much ice was sitting on land before, now all this water go into the ocean, you essentially expand the ocean basin. So therefore, we must correct it for the effect. But guess what Michael Bill is arguing with him about? Well, if, you're, if you're, your ocean basin volume is bigger, then the sea level is not rising. 
right? I mean, somewhat true, isn't it? But, uh, and, and Peltier is saying that this effect that happened 20,000 years ago and the correction is from 19, uh, 2003, is, you've got to correct for that now, okay? I'm telling you, this is a very, very uh, difficult problem, okay? And that's what they're doing. That's how they corrected for that. But then, it's not my word. Peltier is very aware of this problem, okay? He, have given, he was really got the most prestigious of what you can find in earth sciences, by the way, for doing this sort of work because he's the only guy doing it in 76, his famous paper on, he called it the sea level equation. You should study that. It's a very interesting equation. So some of us who are, know a little bit of math, we're not afraid of those things. At least we understand some of it, not that we're totally ignorant. Although he, he did a lot of this uh, 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 solution that is very interesting, but I don't think it's the answer, at least on a practical manner. So here's what Peltier say. The raw data is concerned the entire area of the global ocean. There's no increase in mass. It's actually decreasing. I didn't say it, Peltier said it, guys. So my conclusion for part one is very simple. There is indeed such a thing as failed science experiment, okay? And I don't think they have any believable calibration standard or methodology. Please excuse me and then please tell me which part of my argument is wrong. I'm happy to correct myself because that's what science is all about. It's really a lot of ignorance on my part, but then when I saw this, I just think that I myself don't believe in these results. You guys make your own judgment. Now about tight gauges. This is another really serious old problem, this one. Really old problem. So what does the tight gauges are telling us? There is a small little note that I wrote in, uh, you know, with my friend Nicholas Morner trying to explain about these measurements. I mean, tight gauges, what is tight gauges? It's, you need to have a location that you think that you know where it is. So you essentially have a ping pong ball in the thing that floats in the water, it's going up and down, and then you're just recording. That's all. Of course, there's more sophisticated instrument, but that's all it is. You want to measure the sea level. First look at where the sea level data we have in terms of tight gauges. Okay, on the top there, top right, you can see in the early uh, uh, 1880 to 1890s, very few stations measuring it. So by 1990 to 1999, you can see a, lot, a little bit more data. But then the sampling of the uh, uh, tight gauges is also not very uh, uh, even, right? It's just basically where practically some place where you need to do it. We really need to know what happened in the middle of the ocean, really. Because first of all, you already know in terms of satellite altimetry, I don't think that they have any good data for the coastal region, right? Plus or minus a few kilometers away from the ocean. Okay. Then I say, like I say just now, when I say that uh, the satellite altimetry data is actually not an independent measurement, they calibrate with the tide gauges, right? But then if tide gauges are so good, why don't we just rely on them, right guys? Actually, there is a prescription now, say, to use the tide gauges data, you must use the, the glacial isotatic adjustment, GIA. Remember, Richard Peltier, that model. You got to correct for the movement. But then we have a way to test this. Let's look at it. We, got, we have GPS now, so we can, we can take a look. So essentially, the idea is basically, like I say, that you have this situation during last ice age 21,000 years ago, right? Too much ice and then basically water. Where does the water come from, by the way? It's coming from the ocean, right? That's why the sea level dropped by 120 meters. And then, you know, maybe some of the Chinese people go to Mexico, right? Through this place. And here is essentially what it is. I mean, it's, it's basically near the place where you have a lot of the ice, right? You push it down in the beginning, but once the ice go away, these places started to move out. The famous area is Hudson Bay, right? The land are moving up, or somewhere in Scandinavia, right? You push it down after a while, when the ice is not there, it starts moving out by very large rate. Most places are up to 15 millimeter per year, guys. You want to measure this thing about five or one millimeter per year. And then near the periphery, let's say Delaware and all those places, Right? Where they were near the place where there's no ice sheets, now actually they're sinking because this guy is going up and then the response is opposite on that side. So it's a very complicated problem. Imagine that having a, a, a model that actually correct for, correct for all of this and asking the, the tight gauges to correct for it. Well, how well are the tight gauges can collect for this vertical land motion that we really need to know actually. Even when you have a tight gauges, when you measure that, you really don't know where the actual motion of the place is. Okay? Well, at least we have a little bit of information. Here is the study that done by these retired people. By the way, they are retired, but they also believe in CO2, so they never communicate with me. 
They actually selected about 147 sites with GPS data and then this VM2 is basically that, that model, the glacial isotactic adjustment model. In terms of what they recommended, in terms of this location where we have data, what the, the vertical movement is. Look at the, cor the correction uh, suggested. For the GPS measurements, again, measure from minus to plus 10 millimeter per year. Top to bottom on the model is like that. There's no relationship, guys. The model says that nothing moves. There's not much movement. But then the GPS actually is measuring something of a net subsidence of the order of minus 0.6. It's not a small change, actually. It's actually net sinking, right? Of, of, the, of the locations. So you can already tell for yourself that you have a huge problem in terms of, in terms of trying to understand what is what. And obviously, this is actually a very good uh, proof to, to say that maybe the, the model correction is not so useful. We shouldn't use this thing. I don't know what other alternative, by the way, but at least we shouldn't use this. This should tell you something is wrong with using this model to correct for the tight gauge movement to get you something like uh, the one that two millimeter per year. That's why some of the tight gauge data are not also useful because they're based on this kind of corrections. All right, and this is what the author says. Yeah, indeed, if this average subsidence is further confirmed because the GPS data is only for only like three, four years now, if we keep having the data and keep showing the systematic uh, kind of thing, really ultimately you need to correct for it and also recommend that you don't use the correction from the the glacial isostatic adjustment model. You use the one from GPS directly. Why not, right? Well, I guess they're very afraid that later the model will be of no use and then the satellite altimetry data don't mean anything. So I guess you have a problem of this uh, overexcited Archimedes uh, principle, right? Boom, this guy could go up. <coughs> well, <coughs> the vertical motions are caused by many, many more factors as I try to in imply to you, okay? And the uh, GIA model clearly only useful for the place where, let's say, in Hudson Bay or Scandinavia, right? Where you have a lot of these ice sheets. Even for some of the area in Alaska, it's not useful. As you can see, some of the area in Alaska was not glaciated. It's only around these Cordillera ice sheets that's on the coast of, uh, of Alaska and, and western Washington, right? <coughs> Here's one example. This is the tectonic movement. You have a tight gauge data that measures something like this, boom, in about 1997 or so, earthquake. The sea level all of a sudden go up. This is the bottom curve here, the red curve. Just giving you an example of how complex the system is. Another very well-known example is, by the way, this thing is actually from 1897. We knew all this problem all along, right? The Mississippi Delta has been actually sinking because of this sediment, sedimentation, right? It keep adding load. By the way, another very well-known problem in terms of a sea level problem is basically groundwater. You're taking groundwater out from it. That's another very well-known thing that you can show in Perth and many other areas in the world, especially in Thailand, Chao Phraya area, where, where these are a serious problem. These are related, nothing to do with CO2, by the way, right? There's nothing to do with it. <clears throat> so for the New Orleans areas, you can see that this 1897, we're already aware that it's a fact well-known to people living in this delta of Mississippi where you have large tract of land were long ago abandoned as a consequence of overflow by Gulf water due to sinking of the land. I don't know how we're going to solve this problem. All I'm trying to say is that it has nothing to do with CO2. Please. This is another exciting new paper that I uh, just saw before I came here. Is they found actually a salt uh, kiln. I don't know what you call this, but it's basically things to collect salts that is in the Sundarban, the, the Bangladesh area, that can be dated using this optical stimulated sort of thing from grains, uh, 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 grains of those, uh, 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 those kilns that shows you that actually this whole thing has actually been sinking, those things ages about 300 years ago. So the loading, the sinking of the land has been systematically moving down and down and down and down, started early, early, way, way, way early on. Okay. These are all related to human civilization, or, or the way we live, the way we do our rivers and all that stuff. I mean, really, I don't think you really, really, like I say again, all over and over again, if CO2 is not a cause, please, you can do nothing. You don't, you don't try to say we cut down CO2 and then all of a sudden the land will rise again. It's just not a prescription to anything. I mean, these people are indeed very, very wrong, bad doctors in the sense. 
And here's a quote, right? Talking to you about the rate of that sinking. It's five millimeter per year, guys. Okay? And then remember, this author also quoted something of a rise of only 0.8 millimeter or one, okay? Of the actual sea level changes the, of rising. Of course, those phenomena probably related to the, the warming and, of course, a bit of the glacier issues. Art Robinson. Yeah, another thing that in the articles that I wrote is basically related to this, uh, this Atlantic City tight gauge station. It, you can show the rate of change of this uh, data is somewhat related to this, uh, this sort of uh, events that they have. You know, at, uh, you know of uh, this uh, blind horse that jumping down into the thing in the, in the pier in Atlantic City. Right? So even factors like this that has to be accounted for. So here's the bottom line. In terms of my understanding, in fact, this is another thing that I call it a small breakthrough. For a long time, I'm also a believer. So I, there was a famous paper that written in 1991-92 that says that the tight gauge data has to be 1.8 millimeter per year, which is somewhat of an IPCC claim now. But then I didn't have the courage, and sea level is not my area, okay? And I openly admit I didn't have the courage, don't have the intelligence, so on and so forth. I didn't know that if you take the best data set recommended by NOAA, for example, this thing could have been done about 20 years ago. Okay? If you take the average of them, you can do so many methods. You can do this median equal weight station, all this stuff, okay? with distance and all that stuff. The numbers you get is nowhere close to 1.8. I didn't know that for a fact, by the way. Okay? Remember, I still say that the tight gauge data are not the answer, but I do believe if you have these best sets of data, you at least can take an average of them, see what the number is, but the number is definitely not 1.8. Okay, that part I didn't know before, before Christmas of 2012. Okay? So it shows you that sometimes you read this literature, these authoritative statements really kind of blinded your own vision, your own view or courage to study this issue. Okay? So I admit that fully. Then 2012, Noah have another new sets of data, about 240 of them. What is the number? Roughly the same. Okay? So in that sense, I can tell you, you can, oh, you can also ask, ha have, haven't we seen this number before, roughly? 0 0.1, 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter. I'm trying to drive to my own understanding is that I think the best number you can use for, let's say, 20th century and now is only 1 millimeter per year, okay? It's no more, there's no way it's 1.8, there's no way it's 3, okay? In my view, my humble view. This is through paleo study, paleoclimatic study. This is study of the you know, old methods like from sediments and all kinds of stuff where you can see the estimated thing for, let's say, New Jersey is actually of 0.8 or so. The natural, they call it quote-unquote natural background. I don't think it has been accelerating in that sense. It's been going at a constant rate. Okay? And here are some of the locations that the new study that basically studying the, the peat that is formed in the basal part of it because it's related to groundwater, so it's related to water level where you can deduce relative sea level change for thousands of years, but study the rate of them. For this, however, seven or eight locations covering also the uh, southern hemisphere, you can see the number is anywhere from uh, 1.2 to sinking, point minus 0.1 millimeter. There's one that is very large, Nova Scotia. It's a bit nearer to the, to the ice sheet, formerly glaciated region. Okay? But I don't think that there's anything exceptional in that sense. Okay? And then my good friend Nicholas Mona from Stockholm University has also been studying sea level for about 50 years. This guy wrote about, I don't know how many uh, hundred papers. I, I, I just saw his 1,235 papers, actually. So he had written a paper. He has been analyzed this and has been critical. Uh, I mean, really, people attack him mercilessly. But he also come out with number independent. He's not a believer, by the way. So you can say he's critical of CO2 belief. But then he's been studying sea level for a long time from all these different sources. He also come to the conclusion that is nowhere, by the way, I'm independent from him, even though he's my colleagues, but uh, he basically says something of the order of one milliliter per year or only four inches per century. And then he kind of make this summary. I took this from his most recent presentation in uh, Germany. And he actually have a, a, a thing that really talk about IPCC giving an estimate of all less than one millimeter per year. So I quickly asked him, did IPCC really say that? He didn't answer because he didn't bother because he said, go find it. Indeed, I go find it. Look, what IPCC say? 
In chapter 11, the sea level. But that was the IPCC in 2001 report. Okay? The fourth assessment in 2007 and the next one, you can guarantee you will never find numbers like this again. It will be erased if we don't tell, you know, be, let people more aware of it. It's of the order of 0.7. So, Mona didn't lie. IPCC also, you know, strange, right? They kind of have somewhat of a confession. So what's my bottom line? The part two conclusion is, well, if sea level is rising of the order of one millimeter per year, it's four inches in a century. It's definitely not one to three foot of global sea level rise. That will greatly exaggerate reality. Long time ago, I went to one, the first Heartland uh, Climate Conference in New York City. There was a comedian who actually said this. If the sea is actually rising at the order of four inches in a century, and you don't know how to move back, you deserve to die. <laughs> <coughs> I just want to summarize. It's a complex issue, the sea coast issue. It's related to factor of, you know, where is the boundary between land and sea. This is a very good paper summarized by uh, Nicholas Mohan. This is the paper 1,235, by the way. It's coastal dynamic, land sea changes, sea level changes. These are all the issues that somehow IPCC don't bother to study, okay? You're talking about erosion, silting, you know, so on and so forth, storms, tsunami, blah, 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 the geoids is the key thing. You all know about this geoid business, right? I mean, this is about gravity, you know, gravity potential. The lowest point on the earth is actually 104 meters below, it's in Maldives. The highest point is actually 76 or so. So the difference is 180 meters, just the geoid thing, just because of gravity, different mass distribution. It's 76 in Papua New Guinea. You want to detect and tell me that you can detect this thing down to 0.1 millimeter per year? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm much more skeptical unless you solve this problem. And the geoids can change over time, by the way. Solve the problem, you know, rather than just keep arguing nonsense. I'm almost done. Right. The last one. That's a, a bit of an astrophysicist crazy person, but I always push it to the end. I've been asking, I've been actually wondering about this question myself, actually. So I have the opportunity to come to talk about sea level. I really want to know where ocean come from, right? You can see the history of the Earth. Let's say start from about zero to about 4.6 or 4.7 billion years old. In the early days, when during the Hadean time, we actually have an ocean that is really huge, three times the size of the ocean today. But then there are systematic leaking of the water into the mantle, okay? And in, in this estimate, by another billion, you will reduce the world ocean by 30%. Sea level is actually not so dangerous after all, in that sense, because we just have to cope with it. We have to deal with it, how we, how we want to live our life. I think my time is up, and I'll be here, of course, all weeks. Please ask me any questions. Thank you very much. I'm done.